So shall we get to our first guest who is sat right here next to me, Liz Nichols. She's something of a pioneer, <laughs> I'd say. I'm like, use pioneer? I'm going to use that word. Pioneer for women in the sports industry, having held one of the most high profile jobs in sports in the UK. And you're now the leader of an international sports governing body. You're going to be sharing your career journey with us this morning and just your thoughts on the industry and where it's going at the moment. Of course, you were former chief exec of UK Sport and here you are now as the president of the International <laughs> Netball Federation. It's Liz Nicol. I would ask for a round of applause from my studio audience, <laughs> but they've been told to be very quiet. <laughs> so uh, just have it in your head there. Um, Liz, thank you so much for being able to join us here Welcome. this morning. And being elected as the president of the International Netball Federation, the, it just gets higher and higher and higher, doesn't it? You don't think you could get any bigger <laughs> than CEO of UK Sport, and here you are now, president of a global federation. Yeah, and I'm, I'm delighted to take on that role. Um, I was elected to the, the position just prior to the Netball World Cup in Liverpool um, last year, uh, in July. And, uh, of course, it's the sport that gave me so many opportunities as a youngster. It's a sport that gave me leadership opportunities, and I, I would not have had the career that I'd had if it hadn't been for netball. So when, when I get a phone call from one of the nations around the world that says, would you think about standing for that role? I thought it's the right thing to do, and uh, it's time to give back to the sport that made me. And that's exactly it. You've pretty much gone <coughs> full circle. Mm. You know, you're a Welsh international rug um, rugby player? <laughs> netball player. <laughs> rugby yeah. in a minute. Netball yeah. player. And here you are now, <coughs> you know, president of that. And that must be something that really, really inspires you? It's, it's fantastic, and I, I've loved it. I mean, I've been in, in that post um, for six months now, uh, so it's still early days. Um, I, I, and what I see is a hugely passionate volunteer workforce. Um, uh, and a sport on the rise, you know, record sales in, in Liverpool at the World Cup recently, a growing number of countries that are playing the game now, um, you know, about 20 million young women and girls that are actually uh, still playing and, and engaged with the sport. So it's a, it's a sport on the rise and, um, and it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's something that's r it's really worth doing. It, it's an, it's an organisation that's actually short on financial resource, so it can't actually move things as quickly as it might otherwise do. You can actually employ someone to do a job when something needs to be done. It's a small workforce compared to what I had at UK Sport, a team of six as opposed to a team of 120 at UK Sport, um, but it's, it's a delight to actually have that responsibility. And on that, mm. when we look at UK sport versus um, what you're doing now with the International Federation at Netball, this must be a huge shift for you. <laughs> uh, you know, you just said there, in terms of the workforce you had at UK sport versus what you have now, what are some of the lessons that you took from your UK sport days into, into your new role? Oh, loads. Absolutely loads. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, the, the role of the president is a chair of an organisation uh, with a very fancy name. Uh, and so, uh, so I learnt a lot from the chairs that I worked with at UK sport. Um, the standout was Sue Campbell, who was chair, Baroness Sue Campbell. She was chair at UK sport for 10 years. An, an amazing leader. Uh, had a presence and... Um, uh, and uh, she she was she's very supportive of of, of women uh, in the workforce, um, and um, and then that she was followed by Rod Carr, who was very experienced um, from sailing, uh, who was there for four years, and now of course the delightful Dame Catherine Granger, who has been was a was a was a delight to work with. Um, for two years um, now, and she will continue in that post, I've no doubt, for some years to come. And for you, when you think about, <coughs> again, comparing the two, you were working in an organisation that looked after multi-sports, yeah, weren't you? Yeah. Versus to one now where you are <laughs> solely focused on a sport that you love, of course, netball. How, how, how different is that for you to be able to now move your, your thought <coughs> process away from all the sports to one? Um, it's really interesting. Um, so, so the first move away is from being CEO yeah. and knowing everything yes. and actually being the one that actually uh, finds, the, the solves problems and solutions and leads, but uh, to, to the chair, the president, who actually is, operates at a strategic level and others are doing the doing. So that was the first big lesson. But, but secondly, it's, it's not too dissimilar because, of course, we've got member bodies and each of these national federations around the world are like individual sports governing bodies. Um, 
and and they're they're all, they're all very different. And so, just as the role at UK Sport was to was to invest, yes, but it was also to advise, guide, enable, support. The role of the International Federation is to advise, guide, enable, support the national federations and to help them grow and help them be as good as they could be. So there are lots of similarities. You mentioned Baroness Sue Campbell and Dame Catherine Granger in terms of their roles in your particular yeah. career. How important is it that you have these women who you, you can look up to and learn lessons from across all levels of the organisation? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, absolutely, I think it is important. Um, and uh, just, just go, going back a little bit, because Sue, Baroness Sue Campbell played a really important part in my early career. Um, I first met her when I was an 18-year-old, and I went to Nottingham University, and she was the netball coach of the British University's netball team. Mm. So I knew her a long, long time ago, and she was an inspiration then, and she's an inspiration now. Um, and she pointed me in the direction of moving from chemistry to sport, to a, a degree in sport. I did a degree in chemistry and then a degree in sport. And then she pointed me to my very first job in sport. Okay. So um, I, 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 I remember that, I valued that, and actually that made me much more conscious of the need to do that with other women um, uh, in the workforce as well, to be encouraging of them. So, um, and what I, was, what I was really pleased about in, in the UK sport environment is there was a, a long period of time, of course, when we had, we had the chair who, who was a woman, we had the CEO as a woman, and, uh, and the performance director a woman. And so you know, it, it, that shows that it, it can be done. There are, there are, there are th the barriers sometimes are, are, are not, some we think they're there, but they're not, they're not always there. Um, and, but of course it depends on, on the selection process and, and how that's managed in any organisation. I love that you said that she moved you from chemistry to sport. Yeah. It to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's good because she, she saw your potential. And were there <laughs> other women in your life that really saw your potential just before you did and then moved you in well, a direction? So the, the, the very first person was a, uh, a, teacher, a teacher when I was leaving um, school in South Wales and I was going on to university to study chemistry because I, I could. Um, and uh, she said to me, um, don't lose touch with Welsh netball. And I listened to that voice. She was a teacher from another school. I listened to that voice and I thought, I think she thinks I could play netball for Wales one day. And that's all she said. But I, my antenna and I were up and I heard it. And I, I, I went to university and I went back to Wales to, to netball trials and I was selected and I did play for Wales and I played in a couple of World Cups. And then there's another, there was another point when I was at university when somebody else, uh, which reinforced really what I'd learnt then, um, a, an older student said, I think you should stand to be the president of the Hall of Residence that we were in, 160 women in the Hall of Residence. I didn't even know what that role was. It's like chairing <laughs> gatherings of the students who actually <laughs> will think about what, what we need to do in the facility. You know. and, uh, uh, but I thought she thinks I could do that, so why not? So. Um, I think I was very fortunate that I had these early experiences that gave me more confidence mm. to listen out to words of uh, positive advice. And if you hear something positive from someone you respect, or if you, and if they suggest you can do something, if it's someone you respect, you probably can, so go for it. Mm. And so uh, that, that, for me, those were two early um, experiences I had in my younger years that made me go for my first job in inter-university sport, a very, you know, the only paid employee of an organisation. So in effect, I was a CEO, my first job. The, 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 my f my the I was the first paid um, CEO of England Netball. And uh, uh, so I, 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 would I would went straight into leadership roles because of those early encouraging words. But you must have had <coughs> some leadership qualities. For people to see something you knew, there must have been a personality trait or a characteristic. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they saw. They must I did have seen something. I, I, no, I, d I don't know what I saw. But I do think that if you if you are in a um, if, if you have experience with it, well, I suppose going, if I went right back, I'm from a big family. Yeah. I was number six in the family of seven. Oh gosh! So <laughs> I wanted to be better than the five you have before to fight. me. You have to yeah, fight yeah. your way through. And, and, and my my father was a teacher. My mother was a midwife, and I felt a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. in the local community. So I suppose I had this sort of. I, you know, that's probably something they saw in me, but but um, but I but I will I will always always um, I'll always remember those those individuals that along my path have actually just said a, f a few words of encouragement. They probably don't even know that that what they said that day 
made such a difference. It and, did. and for you, that having mentors <coughs> and mm. the importance of having mentors in your life, where does that place for you? Um, uh, so, so I think in, in, in the early career, it, it is it is it's really invaluable. Yes. Um, and so, um, but as you as you benefit from it, then I grew in confidence, and as my, my as my career progressed. I didn't have to reference anybody else. I, I felt my inner confidence growing then through the experiences that I'd had. Um, but now I, uh, I never say no when somebody asks me for some advice. So it's only last week somebody uh, who's involved with, with Netball asked me uh, for some career advice um, and, and sent me a CV and I had an hour's conversation on the phone. I will always say yes. Okay. And so I think it's important that if you've benefited in the past from these experiences, to be able to give back to others um, because it'd be great to see these these young women progress faster. But what I love about your story, Liz, is that you explained <coughs> that in your formative years, you had this amazing confidence that later on enabled you to go out there and put yourself in positions that made you maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable. Mm. You operate within a very male-dominated mm. industry. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to come across? Um, well, it's, it's really interesting because my first two jobs were in women's sport. So for 18 years, I worked, I was a leader in women's sport. So when I put my hat in the ring for a job at UK Sport, I, for the first time, wondered whether I could do that. <laughs> I wondered, I wondered whether I could do it because, um, because I was a woman and I was actually moving into a, a mixed sport environment. Um, and uh, I'd had, I had took up other two other positions as vice chairs of organisations. So I was vice chair of Commonwealth Games England. I was vice chair of the Sport Recreation Alliance that was, uh, that is now that was. And but I doubted then I could ever be the chair. So th there was that period, which was late 90s, when I doubted I could be the chair of uh, these organisations. A vice chair, yes. Uh, and I wondered whether I could work in a male-dominated environment. But actually, I, you know, as soon as I'd got the job and I was in it, I, I looked back and thought, why the hell did I even <laughs> think about that? Why did it even cross my mind? Because um, I found the colleagues around me were, um, were very open, even, even, I, you know, I, even going in as director of performance in my first meeting, when all of the performance directors that I had to stand up in front of were all men, um, I, f I felt a level of respect um, that made that gave me confidence to actually spend quite a lot of time asking about what they needed from me and and UK Sport mm -hmm. and listening and learning before leading. I think that's I think I learnt to listen to learn yes. and then lead mm -hmm. um, and um, and to do things collaboratively. That's really interesting. And two questions come out of that for me. The first one is about the imposter syndrome. Mm. Because you said for the first time when you went for that role, yeah. you had that doubt. I did have that doubt. And you've never had that before. Yeah. So what do you think it was in that moment that made you think you could not do that role? Um, because I felt that uh, uh, I'd done so well with in England netball uh, and in taking on these other vice chair roles. And I, 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 I didn't know what it looked like. <laughs> so it was, the, it was like stepping into the unknown. Uh, but um, what I learned then is that, you know, nobody knows. That when you take on a new job, nobody, you don't know what you're taking on. You, you, you're stepping into, everybody's stepping into the unknown, no matter what that environment is. And so um, I, uh, yeah, so, so, so it's, it's, uh, so I, can't, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But I, but I was... It didn't take me too long to think I shouldn't have thought that, yeah. uh, in because I was lucky. Now, not every environment is like the environment I stepped into, perhaps, mm. and others others will experience different things. But I I suppose because I'd been a leader, I felt a level of, and I'd been a leader in sport, and I felt a level of confidence that I was coming into a, a strategic organisation with experience of what the customer needed. Uh, so uh, again, I had this inner confidence and be and, and belief. But but I think what I've learnt on the on the way through my journey through UK sport is that it is important to still have your eye ten eye up for the positive things mm. because all too often I've seen young women uh, have their eye ten eye up for the 
negative things um, and and almost like it's almost like having it on too loud the yeah. one the the, the 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 things you don't quite do uh, as right as you might have done um, and you forget all the great things you've done mm. so I I, I, uh, I sort of employed a tactic that I would always on a Friday reflect on my week past for two two several reasons one is am I doing the right things and um, uh, and another would be um, if there were as a different perspective on decisions I'd made if I replayed it would I make that same decision again and if I if I was confident enough I'd make that same decision again given all the information then actually I was able to move on and appreciate um, the successes um, and not be held back by doubters or naysayers um, so I do think it's important to have these little tactics that you can do that. reflect. Okay. I think reflections, uh, reflecting, because most people are doing a lot of hugely good stuff, yeah. and it's only often those l those smaller things that go wrong that you remember most. So it's a Friday, so th Friday thoughts. Mm. Go to see if Liz. Take your time. Reflect. Feel good about yourself. Feel good Friday. That's what we're going to feel, feel good Friday. I think it's fantastic. Feel good Friday. Feel good Friday. And what was really interesting about your story as well is walking into that boardroom, standing up in front of all those men and just saying what you needed to say and feeling like you earned the respect, not feeling intimidated. Mm. And mm. how important is it actually that men are our allies in this industry? Oh, I think it's absolutely critical. Do you know, I was, um, a, 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 so a couple of weeks ago, I was at, I was, drawn uh, a colleague in Australia netball drew my attention to an initiative in Australia that I'd not heard of and I won't get the title of it right but it is a it's a it's 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 men championing in championing diversity right. it's men in industry uh, and and the reason I know about it is that the 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 woman who was in touch from uh, from netball Australia was a, a mentor an advisor to this group of men who were big hitters in industry and they were committed to um to accelerating the uh, diversity agenda. And they were positioning it as something that which is of national significance, international significance, and has economic importance as yeah. well. And I thought this was incredibly powerful. So I think that, um, you know, I think that the role of men in actually um, uh, supporting diversity is, is as important as the role of women. And you say that they were really open-minded, they helped you to be able to do that. Are you seeing more and more of that as time goes on, that that's actually changing and the mindset is changing, that women can absolutely be right at the top of their game in the industry? Uh, I, th I, think, I think the world is changing slowly. Uh, what I gave you an example of is, yeah. a, is, a, is something I haven't seen anywhere else. Okay. I don't, don't know whether it's happening here, it might, okay. might be. Yeah. But, um, but uh, I think things are changing. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I, I do think that some of the initiatives that have been put in place, for example, with getting more women on boards is, has been um, a key part of, of, of the changes and that are happening. you did that at UK Sport, didn't you? created the, the Code for Sports Governance. Well, yeah. both UK Sport and Sport England worked together on that on because that. we were both funding a significant number of sports organisations and yeah. this is where you use the power of the, the lever of the funding yeah. to make significant th important things happen. Could we just give a bit of context actually, what was the Code for Sports Governance and why was it important that you, you know, we drove that initiative forward? Um, well, I have to give credit to the to the <laughs> colleagues in, in uh, my colleagues in UK Sport and Sport England worked incredibly well over a, a probably a year in developing this code, uh, and it is is just you know just just like in any industry you'll say what does good look like in our world, mm -hmm. in the world of leadership leadership and governance is fundamental to the success of any organisation. So, you know any any um, organisation that wants to achieve really needs to look very carefully at its leadership and its governance and mm -hmm. governance is about structure it's about people um, uh, predominantly there are other factors as well um, but uh, what the, the the code the code was a set of requirements that um, explained what what governance is mm -hmm. uh, what good governance looks like and why good governance is important um, and there was a, a strand within that, of course, which was about diversity. Yes. And, and, and the diversity, th that, that particular um, strand, because there were about 67 requirements in this code that if, if the sports needed to comply with um, uh, to, to receive public funding. 
Um, and um, the, but the diversity on boards angle was really about acknowledging that um, if you have a diverse board, board, you have diversity of thought and you're going to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was a nonsense that in fact many of the organisations where the customers were, were both male and female um, were male, had male dominated mm -hmm. boards. So um, targets were set. And and they're they're very ca they're both Sport England UK Sport monitor those regularly, and progress is being made. I was going to say, by the time you left, were you in a in a happy place with that particular code? Oh, with the code, yeah. absolutely. It Good. was uh, you know I thought, why on earth didn't we think about this ten years ago? <laughs> uh, it, it's an amazing tool um, to provoke change. The one th the one regret I have about the women's agenda mm. in my time at UK Sport is that we didn't crack women in high performance coaching. Mm. We did not crack that one. I spent I had a couple of meetings uh, with women in the high performing sport performance industry to hear from them about what were the blockers to them yeah. progressing. Um, so we I knew what the blockers were but we didn't get uh, get to dealing with them. So, so the the blockers were were things like uh, well, uh, culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the the women wanted a more developmental culture, so sort of less about you know complete focus on management and let's have a more of a developmental culture. They wanted to see more case studies of women who had actually uh, succeeded in high mm -hmm. performance s sport. Um, they wanted not, not as an athlete, but as, as as leaders and coaches and administrators. They wanted to have mo mo networks to connect the women yeah. that actually were had 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 experiences and and had good ones to share as well. They wanted they wanted uh, us to have a close look at the recruitment panels mm. um, for uh, for those posts okay. to show the to make sure there was no unconscious bias going on. Um, so there were an, uh, there were a number of things that we we found done. out needed yeah. would would make this world better. They wanted some flexibility as well, yeah. of course, around job share, perhaps, which is a bit more difficult in the performance environment. And that's challenging, isn't it? Always stepping out of a role and thinking, oh, I could have done that little little bit more. But that's the athlete in you, isn't it? I'm sure. <laughs> 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 well, like, what, do I, what I know, what I know <laughs> is, uh, you know, th th in UK sport now they have it. There's a team of people that are, you know, the people development team yeah. that actually have have stepped up in terms of the the strategy that will look at well, who have we got in this high performance landscape, okay. uh, and how do we recruit, retain, retain, and develop? Okay. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure there will be strategies in place now to address those things. Okay, we've had some questions in from um, you guys that are <laughs> listening in, watching on your laptops and we've had this in from Marissa you're at the top of the UK so you were at the top of the UK sports industry since the 1980s what has improved for women what's needed to break the glass ceiling for equality in top positions so I guess some characteristics or drive or experience what do you think personally is needed to break through um, I, th I think I think profile is really important I think what you're doing now yeah. is really important um, I think um, women being being willing to, to give back and, and network and share their experiences and encourage others. Um, I think um, uh, I think it, it's really important to continue to have diversity targets and where you have got levers for change, use those levers for change where you, you've got formal levers for change. I think it'd be great to to, to uh, engage more men in this. And um, and I, you know, the, the example I gave of the, you know, the national, international, and economic benefits, and the diversity of thought that can make better decision making. Why wouldn't any business, and the business of sport, want to actually get more women engaged? So I think the more we talk about it, the more platforms there are to discuss it, um, the more examples that can be shared, the better. Okay, I'm going to take you back to, to student Liz Nicol when you were going <laughs> for the president. President of what was it again? The association students. Oh no! So it's the whole of resi just the whole of <laughs> residents. <laughs> it's just like the building that we lived in. You know. Residents, all of residents. <laughs> I want to take you back to, to to those days, and I want you to give a little bit of advice to yourself, knowing what you know now, all the experience that you've had, and what would you have said to yourself back then? I I, I would definitely the top priority would be. Um, Listen, listen out for words of advice. Yeah. And if those words of advice and positive uh, acknowledgements are coming from someone you respect, 
then actually listen to them, believe them, and go for things that are beyond your reach. Mm -hmm. in, in, throughout my career, I went for jobs that I thought were beyond my reach. I didn't think I was a natural fit yeah. for them necessarily, but I went for them because I didn't want to make, don't make the decision of the selection panels for them. Okay. Put yourself forward. Okay, love that. Okay, that's Feel Good Fridays <laughs> with Liz Nichol. Liz, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Fantastic insights. You're I'm welcome. sure anyone listening in would have definitely, definitely got some advice from you today. Thank you so much. You're